What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is your boy Dub. It's your boy Ross. And we are in the clutch. Hey. Back to y'all with another video today, man. What we got going today, Ross? Uh, we got Mr. Ballin. If you find this treasure map, don't follow it. Um, people ain't gonna listen I, I, to that, man. I, I, I can already tell where this is going. You know, people love to find treasures, find new things, and stuff like that. And guess what happens? It's the usual. All right, there we go. So we're they gonna f check around this out. and they find and out. There we go. The, the undefeated equation of the world. <laughs> Let's get right into this one. Should be a good one, man. Let's go. In the middle of the desert in Arizona, that's called the Superstition Mountains. And for decades, adventurers have been going into these mountains to try Let's to find go. a secret treasure. But many of those adventurers have died trying to do this, and many more have come running out of those here. mountains, claiming that unseen predators are lurking all around, stalking you as you move through these mountains. And so today's story is going to be about one of those adventurers who goes into the superstitions, and he comes face to face with something. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time you're at the like button's house, please replace their like favorite what cologne there, like with what tuna juice. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on juice. all notifications mm -hmm. so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Go support the homie, man. Okay, let's Go get support. into support. today's story. For sure. We still got to look up the uh, images to that one video. He hasn't learned, y'all. He's like one of these people out here. They just hadn't learned. Late on the afternoon of June 14th, 1931, a 59-year-old man named Dr. Adolf Ruth climbed off his donkey that he'd been riding on for hours Adolf. through the Superstition Mountains <laughs> in Arizona. <laughs> Once he was got a, little, got a little close there, man. Got a little, got a little close. Just a little close. Oh. Hopefully no uh, great, great, great descendant of no. someone. But He yeah. don't got the same name, but the last name, but, you know, their first name. You know what I'm saying? Got to look close. Look close. <laughs> Thought the animal. The doctor shook his legs to work out the cramps. And then he just took in the scenery all around him. And as he did, he smiled. Now, to the average person, what Dr. Ruth was seeing in front of him would look very impressive. There were all these jagged peaks on either side of him that jutted straight up into the sky that almost looked so steep they couldn't even be climbed. And this mountain range was cut through all over with all these twisting and turning canyons that almost seemed like a maze. Also, high up in these mountains were all these caves where people used to live, but now they were abandoned. In fact, today, mm. if you were to travel through the Superstition Mountains, you could go days without seeing another person. And that Damn. was true back in 1931 uh, yeah. when Dr. Ruth was there. But Dr. Ruth knew that where he was standing right now between two towering rock walls was not just a regular desert canyon. This particular stretch of desert was about to make Dr. Ruth a very rich man. He was going to be the very first person to actually find the Lost Dutchman gold mine. The mm. same Lost Dutchman gold Not mine that had claimed the lives of hundreds of other <laughs> treasure seekers who had come into the Superstition Mountains and not come out again. But Dr. You know, you Ruth know. knew he had a special advantage that nobody else who had come out here looking had had. He had a treasure map that was going to show him where this treasure was and he knew it was right nearby. And without even thinking, he reached into his pack that was slung over his shoulder and he felt the edges of the treasure map, which was folded up and tucked inside of his notebook. But as Dr. Ruth was daydreaming about finding this treasure, he heard someone grunt from behind him. Mm. And suddenly Dr. Ruth pulled his hand out of his pack and he whipped his head around and he looked at the two cowboy guides who had brought him out here. And Dr. Ruth just said, what? In Dr. Ruth's daily life, he was a retired veterinarian and a government employee who worked in Washington, D.C. He was a small guy with glasses and he walked with a limp. Government and he employee. knew these two cowboy guides of his just thought he was some frail old man. And this deeply offended Dr. Ruth. Oh. And so because the doctor totally resented these cowboys, he had told them that, yes, I need your help getting me to a particular spot in the desert. But once I get there, you guys are done. You can leave. I'll pay you and you can just go away. I'll be fine on my own. And as it happened, they had reached this particular spot. And now Dr. Ruth is looking at these guys like, all right, let's go get out of here. You don't need to be here anymore. But the cowboys, now that they were at this spot where they're supposed to go back home, they kind of hesitated before they left because they looked at Dr. Ruth and 
they did think he was kind of a frail old mm. man, and they knew all about how all these people. Yeah, you look at him just off of yeah. you know, and this you don't think he's gonna be out here you know, <clears throat> treasure searching by, by himself, himself. Yeah. in the wilderness. You you would think like uh. Probably look like somebody that probably you know get lost in the fucking supermarket. I don't know about yeah. <laughs> getting lost in the actual real world so by yourself. I, yeah, had died going into this canyon to look for this treasure, uh. and so the cowboy who had kind of cleared his throat and made a noise to get Doctor Ruth to turn around, he chimed in and said, "You know, Doctor, I don't know if this is a good idea for you to go in there on your own." And Doctor Ruth again is super offended, and he just says to the cowboy, "I'm fine." Just go. I'm going to set up camp. I'm good. Get out of here. And then Dr. Ruth pulled out his wallet. He handed some money to the cowboys. The cowboys took the money. All they right. looked at each other and just kind Deuces. of shrugged. Good and luck. Then the cowboys turned around Peace. and began galloping. I would have got him just go on the horse. All right. All right. <laughs> I did my part. Homies, I, I told him. I did my part. I told him. I told him. I told him. Have you heard from the doctor in a couple days? No. I don't know what happened to that. I told I got that nigga. my money. I got my money. Hey, we we drinking that moonshine yes, tonight. <laughs> Let's do it. Time for a hoedown. Dr. Ruth was standing there feeling kind of proud of himself for getting rid of these guys. All but right. as they kind of faded into the distance, <laughs> Dr. Ruth turned back around and he looked out at the landscape. And suddenly, now that he was actually all alone, a lot of his bravery was it. now gone. Now he was feeling maybe a little apprehensive. But Dr. Ruth reminded himself that he knew what he was doing. He was right, not course. a frail old man, oh, despite the way he looked. Of course. He could handle himself, of and he course. certainly knew this area well. He had a map. He'd be in and out. He would get that treasure, <laughs> and then he'd be rich and famous. That's what they all say. So with that in mind, mm -hmm. Dr. Ruth grabbed his things off the ground. He hopped <sighs> back on his donkey, and he began slowly marching his way deeper into the canyon. A little while later, as the sun was starting to set, Dr. Ruth decided it was time to stop. When you so know something's gonna go wrong, like it's just all the signs are pointing to this is they're always there and badly. I mean, he don't care about life. To at him all. sending them away and then looking at it's like it's you can't it's it's, it's can't perfect. make it up. You can't make it up. He man. stopped his donkey. He hopped off. He found a clearing by the side of the trail. <laughs> and he began setting up his campsite. <laughs> and then finally, once the canvas tent funny, was all set still, up, and his campsite was good to go. You are laughing. Dr. That's Ruth cold. started a small fire, and then he rolled a small seen this story in front of the fire. And he sat down over. on it, and then he reached into his pack and he pulled out that notebook. And from inside the notebook, he pulled out the old fragile <laughs> treasure map. Dr. Ruth's son had acquired this treasure map from a man in Mexico, and this man in Mexico apparently got it from a family that used to do mining in the Superstition Mountains, and they had drawn out this mm. map before apparently they were all massacred inside of the Superstitions. Oh, but somehow or another, their <clears> map <throat> they had drawn about where they thought this treasure was had survived. And so that don't even son sound had gotten this map and given it to Dr. Ruth. And so Dr. Ruth held the map up and he stared at it for a second. And as he did, he couldn't help but be drawn to this huge rock formation way off in the distance. So not on the map, but actually in real life, basically far down the canyon, there was just this massive rock formation. And for a second, Dr. Ruth was looking at it, thinking it kind of looked like a huge oversized gravestone. And in a way, it kind of freaked him out. Oh, but he looked back at the map and he realized there actually was a drawing on this map that clearly represented this big rock formation. Mm. And on the map, it had an arrow pointing to this little drawing. And it said this thing, this big rock formation, was called Weaver's Needle. And according to the map, apparently the treasure was right near Weaver's Needle. Wow. And so Dr. Okay. Ruth was like, great, tomorrow I'll head straight for Weaver's Needle. I'll find the treasure and I'll be rich and famous. And on that note, Dr. Ruth folded the map up, he tucked it back into his notebook, you already put it back old and retired. Pack, and then right. he took his beans and meat off the fire and he began to eat. He don't and need as to he did, this, he whistled periodically to fill the silence that was filling the entire canyon. Commercial break. Hey, if you want to. Back when I first started Mr. Ballin, so early 2020, I was doing all my work out of this room it. in the back of my house ah, in Pennsylvania. Damn. It was That's basically a, like a shed. That's a it young Mr. B. Not up to code. Whoever had owned it. <laughs> By the time Dr. Ruth was the early done stages eating food, of balling. it was totally dark inside of this canyon, like completely pitch black and silent. And as the doctor was kind of taking in this moment of absolute darkness and silence, he was startled by a sudden sound coming from high up one of the canyon walls. It sounded like hooves marching on stone, and it kind of echoed through the whole canyon. 
and for a second, Dr. Ruth felt relieved, even though he had been adamant, especially to the two cowboy mm -hmm. guides, that oh, he wanted guys to go into this canyon man. by himself. I thought, I thought he was now saying... that he was here by himself, and it's so dark and quiet and kind of spooky, he was glad to hear hooves because it meant that must be a person riding a horse, and so I'm not alone anymore. But when Dr. Ruth called out and said, who's there? There was no response, uh, and there were no more hook sounds. It just went totally quiet again. And then, from all over the canyon, all Dr. Ruth heard was the yipping and howling of coyotes everywhere. Uh, By this point, shit. Dr. Ruth couldn't help it. He felt terrified. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly, all he was thinking about were all the stories he had heard about unseen predators lurking in the shadows, stalking people who come into this canyon. And so, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ruth decided, you know what? I'm just going to bed. And so he extinguished his fire, he, he packed up his things, and he went inside of his tent, and he laid down inside of his bedroll. And even though he knew he really wasn't actually safer in here, all he had was, you know, <laughs> canvas felt, tent felt material safer. Yeah, protecting yeah. him from the outside world. But mentally, being inside the tent, he just felt safer. And so Dr. Ruth would lay in his tent in the total darkness, kind of on edge for a while, you know, wide awake, listening intently for more hoofbeats or something out there. But there were no more sounds. The night remained silent okay. and dark. And eventually, Dr. Ruth fell asleep. But in the middle of the night, Dr. Ruth suddenly woke up. And it was totally dark and silent. And he sat up and he looked out of his tent. The flap was open. And at first, he couldn't see anything. It just seemed like darkness out there. But then he realized, moving around very slightly, pretty far away from his tent, but not that far away, were two eyes staring at him, unblinking, just staring directly wow, into his tent. Bro. And Dr. Ruth, I mean, his heart started to race, and he's realizing bro. that an animal, a person, something boy. is right there. He, I don't even think he got a weapon. He just, he he's out just there on out face. There bare. <laughs> just bearing it. Just, 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 just bare, bearing nothing. Just out there just with the world. Just, yeah, I don't know. That's wild, bro. And so Dr. Ruth, he was about to yell out when suddenly <laughs> the eyes blinked and vanished. Dr. Ruth fumbled for his gun and he oh, threw okay. it out of the tent and he yelled, I'll shoot if you come back. All right, well, okay, there we go. Okay, at least. He had to bleak Thank you. All right, I'm glad he had something on him because I'm like, bro, hey, you, I would have pulled that out way quicker. <laughs> I, I would have woke up with it. Hey, facts, facts. I'll shoot. But there was nothing. Dr. Ruth would stay awake for at least a couple more hours, I just anxiously did. staring out of his tent, yeah, wondering if this that, thing, actually. this person, whatever it was, was nearby, but he never saw the eyes again, and there were no more sounds outside, and so eventually, Dr. Ruth did lay back down inside of his bedroll, and he went to sleep. When he woke up in the morning, Dr. Ruth immediately went outside and began walking out in the direction where he saw those eyes to see if he could find some tracks on the ground. In his head, he was hoping he would find a bunch of coyote tracks and that would explain, you know, what these eyes were. Even mm -hmm. though in the back of his head, he's thinking that didn't look like a coyote. Mm -hmm. And so as Dr. Ruth began walking in that direction, he did begin to see loads of coyote tracks all over the place. And so he's thinking, there it is. It was a coyote. My brain's just playing tricks on me. But he got maybe 15 or 20 feet away from his tent and he noticed there was another set of tracks that were not coyote tracks. They were human tracks, or what appeared to be human tracks, like barefoot feet tracks, uh -oh. except the size of them were really small, like a child's foot. Now, Dr. Ruth was a really small guy and wore a men's size six, so he had mm. very small feet. Damn. And for a second, Dr. Ruth thought, oh, you know, maybe these are my footprints. But he was like, I wasn't over here, and I wasn't walking around barefoot. So whose tracks were these? And then, making it worse, Dr. Ruth noticed these little prints, these little human-looking prints, they walked all the way over to the side of his tent, and they appeared to circle his tent over and over again. But then the prints didn't wander off and disappear. It's almost like the prints just continued in a circle, and then whatever this was making the prints just stopped where it was and vanished. At this point, Dr. Ruth was terrified, no, and he decided, let's just go towards Weaver's Needle, let's find this treasure and get out of here. And so he rushed back to his tent, he gathered up his things, he hopped back on his donkey, and he began heading towards Weaver's Needle, the thing that looked like a big gravestone. After riding for a couple of hours, Dr. Ruth was close enough to this huge formation that he was actually inside of the shadow cast by this Weaver's Needle. 
And when Dr. Ruth consulted his map, he saw that where the treasure was supposedly located was actually within the shadow of Weaver's Needle. And so okay. he knew he was close. And so Dr. Ruth continued following the map as best he could. He turned this corner behind a rock formation and then right up ahead, he saw this big wall of cacti that all had these ax heads lodged into their flesh. Like someone had taken an ax and smacked the ax head in and then broken off the handle, but like dozens of times. Mm. And so Dr. Ruth stopped and he's looking at these cacti and then he looked at the map and he realized on the map was actually a drawing that kind of resembled these cacti with the axe heads in them. And so he's thinking, oh my goodness, this map is accurate. I've found another landmark. I must be near the treasure. And so now all he had to do was kind of back up and orient this cacti with the axe heads in it with Weaver's Needle and its shadow. And if you could just orient it correctly, he would know exactly where to go. And after backing up and moving the map around a couple of times, he finally had it totally oriented and he realized there was a path straight up ahead that would go right to the base of Weaver's Needle. And he thought, that's it, that's where I dig, there's the treasure. And so feeling excited, Dr. Ruth hopped off the donkey, he grabbed his pickaxe and he began moving in the direction of where he was going to dig. But before he got there, he heard something behind him. He turned to look, but by the time he saw whatever was behind him, it was already too late. An explosion rang out and then everything went dark. 10 days later, those two cowboy guides who had brought Dr. Ruth oh, into the Superstition Mountains, they came back out to check on him to make sure he was okay. And they found his campsite and it was abandoned. And they searched the entire area all the way down to Weaver's Needle and back. And there was no trace of Dr. Ruth. Over the next 45 days, a much larger search party was launched in this area to try to find oh, Dr. Yeah, Ruth. Gone, yeah, but at the end of those 45 days, there still was no sign of Dr. Ruth. And so the search was called off and it was assumed that Dr. Ruth was dead. Yeah. Three and a half months after that big search ended, so in December of 1931, another set of explorers Man. were in the Superstition Mountains near Weaver's Needle, the big gravestone looking rock formation, and they would discover a human skull on the ground. It was Dr. Ruth's skull, and it had two gaping holes in the side of it. A Damn. month after that, another set of explorers who were in the Superstition Mountains would find the rest of Dr. Ruth's skeleton located approximately one mile away from where his head had been found. Damn. But while the discovery of Dr. Ruth's body did provide some closure for his family, it actually only deepened the mystery of what the heck is going on in the Superstition Mountains. Because one, despite the fact that Dr. Ruth's skull had been found with two holes in it and the fact that his skull was found one mile away from the rest of his skeleton, authorities who investigated his death quickly said Dr. Ruth died of natural causes and they closed the case. And the second weird thing mm -hmm. that only deepened the mystery was when they were searching Dr. Ruth's campsite, they would find his checkbook. And inside of his checkbook, there was all this writing that was clearly from Dr. Ruth, you know, writing his checks. And then towards the back of this book, there was a relatively fresh looking message and the handwriting looked totally different than Dr. Ruth's handwriting mm. that just said, Veni, Vidi, Vici, which in Latin means I came, I saw, I conquered. Now, we don't know who wrote this message, but the running theory is whoever Whoa. very likely killed Dr. Ruth wrote this note inside of his checkbook but we don't know why they wrote this note. Now, eventually people began to think that because of this note that was in his checkbook, that that suggests that maybe Dr. Ruth really was on the precipice of actually finally finding this treasure. And maybe the stories were right about the Superstition Mountains, that something lurks in the canyon protecting this treasure. And when it saw Dr. Ruth was about to take the treasure, this thing killed Dr. Ruth to stop him, i.e. Mm. they came, saw, <clears throat> and conquered Dr. Ruth. Possibly. Also, adding Maybe. to the strangeness of this entire story, in 1945, so 13 years after Dr. Ruth's skeleton was discovered, an adventurer named Barry Storm published a book about his journey to try to figure out what actually happened to Dr. Ruth. And he would say in this book that when he went into the Superstition Mountains, somebody started firing a gun at him from off in the distance. And after taking cover and looking, he couldn't see anybody. And then when he began taking steps farther into the canyon to continue that, to explore, that, tell me the shots going. rang out. Yeah, nah, bro. If somebody's shooting at me, I'm hey, bro, home. I'm good, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. Yeah, you got it. You got it, fam.
whatever it is that I'm looking for, clearly I don't need to see. So I was trying to see what happened to old buddy, but I I, I figured it I, out I now. Found I'm out. good, bro. Thank you. Thank you for the warning shots. I appreciate you, man. I don't need you be else. safe out here, man. Be cool, man. Be careful. Stay dangerous. It's, it's, it's getting cold out here at night, man. <laughs> You might have a blanket, though. You got bullets to keep you warm, so you should have a blanket, too. Like I'm, I'm going to tell the next person not to come back here either, man. You good, bro. I got you. I got actually, you. actually, I'm going to put that in my book. Don't go there. Yeah. Don't go. That's Nigga wild. getting shot at. I don't see where he's shooting me from. So Let I'm me go closer. investigate. I think, oh, you didn't know. This is wild, bro. All right, bro. Again, and so Barry Storm ultimately fled oh, no. anybody, yeah, and then so. when he began taking steps farther into the canyon oh, yeah, to man, continue to explore, the shots <laughs> rang out again. And so Barry Storm ultimately <laughs> fled the Superstition Mountains. Oh wow! Really? And he would tell people that whoever was out there shooting at him, it seemed like they were shooting warning shots at yeah. him. Like if you come any closer, I'll kill you. To this day, no one has ever actually found any hidden treasure in the Superstition Mountains, but about 9,000 people will go out there looking for the treasure every year. Y'all got it, bro. Yep. All 9,000 all 9, of y'all got it, man. Yeah, y'all the <laughs> true definition of effing around and always wanting to find out, bro. You um, eventually will find out. I'm good, bro. I'm man. Look, man. I I'm can straight. write the book. I can write the book from outside. Right. Like, I'm straight. <laughs> he went in. He didn't come back out. That's it. They found his skull. The end. End of story. End, end of story. Bro. End of story. But man, I love when Mr. Baller tells these stories, bro. He, he yeah, for sure. He makes you. He paints the picture so well, man. It's like you can almost see it, uh, mm -hmm. just in storytelling form. So if y'all enjoyed it, y'all already know what to do, man. Make sure you run up the likes, subscribe. Let us know what else we need to be checking out next. Not only supporting us, but make sure you go to his content as well. The link is usually at the end of the video, at the bottom in the links. So make sure y'all go support him. Go run uh, the lights and stuff as well for him. Oh, man. Get it out, dude. But nah, we love y'all. Continue to spray love, be loved. It's got me shook it for a little bit. So, you know. But nah, catch y'all in the next one. Peace out. Already. This is from Houston. If you got a problem, then we got the solutions. And there's no illusion. I made this shit happen. I'm living life lucid. I'm switching my strategies. Now they hate on me because I'm causing casualties. But why are they after me? Deep inside, they know they can't handle half of me.